In the New Testament community today, it seems that prayer is something that most people understand least about. It seems that so many times we get ourselves in trouble, and that's when we start crying out to God. And then suddenly there's no answer from God, and so we lose heart and we become discouraged. So what I want to do today is give a little introduction, and then I want to go into a sermon, which I'll title for you in just a moment. But in 1 John 5, verse 18, that's the scripture I want to start out with. 1 John 5, verse 18. I'll read this from the King James Version. We know that whosoever is born of God sins not. That's a powerful statement by the Apostle John. Notice the next phrase, though, and it qualifies what this means. Born of God sins not. But he that is begotten of God keeps himself. And that wicked one, we know that Satan, touches him not. Now, this is a dynamic statement which absolutely proves there is such a thing in the New Testament plan of God as being begotten of God and then being born of God. Amen. Now, this is very dramatic because, let's just think, here's a husband and wife coming together under the proper relationships, contractual agreement for marriage, just like God requires, otherwise it's sin for sexual relationships. Then the sperm from the male, male impregnates the egg from the female. That child is begotten. That child is a human being from conception. It's life. And yet it's begotten. It's not yet born. It goes through nine months of gestation. And then suddenly the water breaks. The child is delivered as a full-fledged human being. It's born. God made the reproductive cycle to picture what he's doing for the human race. And how he is reproducing himself. Because it says in Genesis 1.1... In the beginning, God created. Then down in verse 25, 4, 5, and 6 down there, it said that he made man in his own image. So he's reproducing himself, and he's showing us how he's doing it through the begotten and born process. Now, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Now remember, John, the apostle John stated very clearly that you're born, you do not sin anymore. You're begotten now, and we keep ourselves. Now, think about this, because the scripture I'm about to read, Ephesians 1, verse 13 and 14, is talking about Jesus Christ in verse 12, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, Jesus Christ, also, after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you can liken the Holy Spirit to the sperm of the male, and our mind, the spirit in man, that gives us the reasoning power and so on, the uh, ability to accumulate information, knowledge, is the egg. And God impregnates our mind and we're begotten. Look at verse 14. This Holy Spirit, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Now what happens when you buy a home? You have to give the real estate agent an earnest, a down payment, showing your good faith that you're going to purchase that home and give the full purchase value of it. And that's exactly what God's saying right here. The Holy Spirit is an earnest or a down payment of our inheritance. Notice how long this down payment lasts. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's us. So we're begotten with God's Holy Spirit now and that's with us until we're totally redeemed and we're born fully. But now remember the Holy Spirit says that uh, uh, we read that it keeps us now. It keeps us. But that doesn't mean that we can't sin, because every one of us know we still sin, even though we have God's Holy Spirit. And yet, when we're born, and the birth process has been achieved, we have a spirit body, we'll never sin again, because we have God's character built into us, and God doesn't sin. And He's not tempted with evil, either. Well, in order to verify this even stronger, turn to John 3. John chapter 3, because John, in his book, 1 John, is the one that made that very clear, that we're begotten and then we're born. Begotten, we keep ourselves now away from Satan as long as we're on God's side and we don't turn away from him. And yet at the same time, when we're born, we cannot sin. It's period. It's just dogmatic. We cannot. John 3, verse 3 to 8. Now you have to understand the previous verses, Nicodemus is coming to Jesus at night because he's afraid of the Jewish community of that day. 
Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We're in the physical realm right now. We cannot see the spirit world. As a physical human being, we can't see angels, we can't see God the Father, we can't see Jesus Christ, we can't see cherubim, we cannot see anything spiritual. We just can't do it. Verse 4, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? So he understood it's a birth. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water, we know that's baptism, and the Spirit... He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we saw in Ephesians 1, 13, or 12 and 13, or I think it's 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit is a down payment. It's an earnest until we receive that full-fledged spirit body. Now, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's us now. Even though that we have God's Holy Spirit in our mind, we're still flesh, even though we're walking after the Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Now, anyone who's had math in school, and that's probably every one of us, realize that an equation, one side has to balance on the other side. If you've got 4 plus 4 equal, that's 4 plus 4 is 8. So if you have that which is born of Spirit is, it has to balance on the other side. Spirit is Spirit. Now, let's prove it down in verse 7 and 8. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lifts, and you hear the sound thereof. So we see the wind, or we hear the wind. We see flags blowing. We see tree limbs, but we cannot see the air itself. It's invisible, but cannot tell where it comes and where it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. When we're born of the Spirit, we'll be invisible to the physical realm, even though we can materialize at any time that we choose to. But we will be full-fledged spirit. Now, this is only the introduction. Until we're fully born, we're absolutely dependent upon God. I think each one of us need to realize that. Totally, completely, absolutely dependent upon God until we are fully born. There are so many distractions in this world right now that our minds are turned from one circumstance to another. Whether it's getting in trouble with the IRS or whether it's some other governmental problem or whether it's a work-related problem whether it is our own problems that we create for ourselves due to going after the flesh instead of turning and walking after the Spirit, we often find ourselves in trouble. And we wonder, when we cry out and we plead for God to intervene, where are you, God? Why don't you hear my prayer? Why don't you answer? I'm talking to you now. Why aren't you listening? We, we need to ask ourselves, why? is our prayer so many times being hindered? What can we do in our personal life to see to it our prayers go straight to God through Jesus Christ and not have them hindered? I want to try to give, in this period of time, if I can, 14 reasons why our prayers may be hindered. And I think if we'll look at these, if we'll put them into effect in our daily life or eliminate the problems, possibly our prayers can become very powerful with God. And we might just begin to see some instant answers to prayer, even in terms of healing and so on. So the first one I want to mention that might actually hinder your prayer to God is if you or I go astray. If we turn away from God and we what many people call, I believe in the Baptist community, call it backsliding. Well, it's a, it's a fine term. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, so God can save. Neither his ear heavy that it can't hear, so definitely God can hear us anytime he wants to. But notice what the problem is, verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. That's pretty clear. Our own physical iniquities that we give in and commit in the flesh cut us off from God so that He won't hear. Well, Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64, verse 7. There is none that calls upon your name and stirs up himself to take hold of you. For you have said, or you have hid your face from us and have consumed us because of our iniquities. Once again, it's our iniquities. And notice here that nobody would call upon God, nobody would beseech His face 
They wouldn't take hold of his name and they wouldn't be stirred up to obey God. So this is what cuts us off from God. When we go astray, we let our own iniquities, our own sins cut us off. Well, the word iniquity here means perversity or evil. So our own evil or perversities, this is what cuts us off from God. Now, Romans or Act, John, the book of John, chapter 9, verse 31. And this becomes so clear that our own sins is what keeps our prayers from being answered in many cases. This is just one of 14. I hope I can get to them all today. John 9, verse 31. Jesus was going to heal a man, and he did. Now notice what he says, verse 31. Now we know that God hears not sinners. God does not hear a practicing sinner, someone who knows they are sinning, and yet continue in those sins. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he hears. That's the key. Finding out what the will of God is, what this book says, put it into our life, implement it in our everyday life, then God is going to hear us. But he will not hear us when we remain a practicing sinner because God knows our heart. He knows every thought and he records everything. But a second reason why our prayers could be hindered is hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is not deception. Deception, you don't know any better. You're just deceived. You're doing what you think is right, even though you don't realize you're wrong. Well, God overlooks much of this kind of thing, deception and ignorance. But when it comes to hypocrisy, hypocrisy is literally knowing one thing to do it, but you do the opposite in secret. You know it, but you won't live it. That's hypocrisy. Look in Job. Job, which is right before Psalms in the Old Testament. Job chapter 13, verse 16. He also shall be my salvation. This is Job talking about God. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. So hypocrisy will cut you off where you cannot come before God. And you will always go through Jesus Christ, our high priest, to God the Father. But now, not only Job 13, but the same book, Job 27. This becomes very, very clear. Job 27, verse 8 to 10. For what is the hope of the hypocrite? I mean, that becomes very pointed right there. Job wants to know, okay, God, you ask these people, what's the hope of a hypocrite? Though he has gained, even though a person, but through hypocrisy, they can talk out of one side of their mouth and live a different, different way, and even though they gain physically, and they have possessions, Physical possessions, though he have gained when God takes away his soul. So what good will it do you and I to be a hypocrite? Talk out of one side of our mouth, put on a show, and not truly be converted to Christianity when, when God, we're going to lose salvation. Look at verse 9. Will God hear his cry when trouble comes upon him? I don't believe he will. Verse 10. Will he delight himself in the Almighty? If a person is a hypocrite, he's not going to delight himself in God. He's going to look one way and he's going to act another in secret. And so it's a fake. It's a fraud. And God will not honor this. And that person is going to lose salvation. Will he always call upon God? No, he won't. He won't look to God in his times of stress or even in his good times. So point number three that I want, <clears throat> that I want to make today, why our prayers may be hindered is idolatry. And I've given two sermons on idolatry lately, but there's more to idolatry than that. But in Jeremiah chapter 11, Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 11 to 13. Jeremiah 11, verse 11 to 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them. Notice, this is God doing this. He's speaking that he, in the first person, that he's going to bring evil upon these people in Israel, Jerusalem, because in the previous verse, you'll see they're backsliding, which they shall not be able to escape. They're not going to be able to get out of this. And though they shall cry unto me, notice this, they're crying to God, I will not hearken or listen unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods. Notice, that's not the true and the living God. But they're going to end up saying, well, God didn't answer me. So they'll go after their other gods unto whom they offer incense. And he goes on to show in this particular section of scriptures that in all the cities of Judah, they had different gods setting up and idols to all of them. And you wonder why God wouldn't hear their prayer? Because of idolatry. 
Look at the last phrase of verse 13. The last, well, I'll just read the whole thing. For according to the number of your cities were your gods, O Judah. Every city had a different god they were worshiping instead of the one god that brought them out of the land of Egypt. And according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing? Notice, even altars to burn incense unto Baal. And Baal was Nimrod. They were committing idolatry. No wonder God was going to bring evil upon them to correct them. And yet when they cried out to him, he wouldn't listen because they wouldn't repent. They would give a half-hearted prayer, well, help us, God, when he wouldn't listen because of their sins, they'd turn to their dumb idols. And they couldn't answer anything for them. So idolatry can definitely cut us off from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But these were physical idolaters. They were things that they erected. They could bow down before. But, of course, we realize that idolatry takes many forms. It could be prestige on a job. It could be the big automobile, the big home. It could be parents, relatives, our own children, husband and wives. It can be anything that we put before the true and the living God. But in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14, it's just a short phrase. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from it. So if we'll turn around when we recognize anything coming between us and God, run from it and get on the right track, then this will help our prayers to be answered more quickly and the way that we choose if we understand the will of God. But now, Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel. It's right before Daniel in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 20. God was dealing all the way through here with the house of Israel. And he was showing why they went into national captivity. Ezekiel 20 verse 3 set the stage for this. Son of man, speak unto the elders of Israel and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, are you come to inquire of me? God's asking Israel, look, are you as physical human beings who are supposed to be called after my servant Jacob's name? His name was changed to Israel and he was a prince with me. Are you coming to inquire of me? Are you praying to me? And say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Are you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Why? What was it that cut these people off where God wouldn't even listen to their prayer? Well, just for an example, you have to read this whole chapter. But say in verse 11, I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Verse 12, Moreover also I gave unto them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And you go on down and read verse 13, But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walked not in my statutes. That's the holy days. They despised my judgments. Those were the renderings, the punishments for sin. If you committed adultery, it was to be death by stoning. Which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted then I said I'd pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. And that older generation, no one except two men, went into the land of promise. All the children who were under the age of what you might say accountability at that particular time grew up and went into the land. All the older generation died because they continually broke God's law. Now, drop down into verse 31. Read this whole chapter on your own sometime. Verse 31. For when you offer your gifts, so people would come and offer their gifts of offerings on the altars. When you make your sons to pass through the fire, notice what they're doing. They're offering live babies on the altars to be burned as a sacrifice. And God doesn't want that. That's what the inhabitants of the land that they came into were doing. You pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? And today we are spiritual Israel. We are the ones with God's Holy Spirit who are living according to God's law and after the Spirit. And what do we see in this land? We're offering our unborn children at the, at, at the altar. Not to pass through the fire, but to pass through the salt solutions. It's called abortion. The stainless steel knives. We are offering as I, I, in idolatry our children to the God of this world instead of the true and the living God. So God wouldn't listen to them because of idolatry. So that's the third point. We should get away from idolatry in every facet of our life once we recognize it. But a fourth point that will literally hinder our coming to God and having our prayers answered is family problems. Family problems. 
First Peter three, verse seven. First Peter three, verse seven. And the previous verses is talking about how Abraham and Sarah got along with each other. And Sarah was a fantastically humble wife, and she she actually called her husband Lord. That's how how much respect she had for him. It says in verse seven, likewise, you husbands. Dwell with them, talking about wives in the previous verses, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. We're weaker, the ladies are weaker physically, not spiritually. And as being heirs, get this, heirs together of the grace of life. So if you're fortunate enough where a husband and wife in the same family or a part of the church and you have God's Holy Spirit, you should honor one another. And just because the wife is physically weaker, by our physical built does not mean that she's spiritually weaker in any way whatsoever. That Notice why. Your prayers be not hindered. So that husband-wife relationship is very vital because we are co-heirs together with Jesus Christ. And when we don't get along, we fuss, fight, undermine each other, we cause each other difficulty, and even in front of other people, we set a bad example, then our prayers are definitely going to be hindered. They just are. Well... Let's turn also now to Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 25. Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 25. Family problems can definitely hinder our prayers. Ephesians 5, 22 to 25. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And sometimes we think, well, God's picking on women. Oh, no, He's not. Look what this is going to picture. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as God made the family relationship to picture Jesus Christ's relationship with the church. You and I that make up the church is the bride of Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be the husband. And where the church is to submit to the husband or Jesus Christ in every way. So God is showing something here. Verse 23, I'll read the whole verse. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, does that mean men can run roughshod over women? Oh, no. Look in verse 25 or 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, verse 25 sets the husbands real straight. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a tall order. You've got to be willing to lay down your life for your wife. And let's face it, the Ten Commandments, the first four, show love toward God. The last six show love toward our fellow man. And, and Christ said the summation was love to God and love toward neighbor as yourself. And if you love your wife as you do your own self, you're never going to hurt that person in any way. That you knowingly, you wouldn't knowingly hurt them. You're always going to feed them. You're going to close your wife. You're going to love them. You're going to take care of them. You're going to do everything you can to build them up because you are heirs together with Jesus Christ looking forward to the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. So let's not let family relationships hinder our prayers. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. Defraud you not one the other. This is husband and wives and their relationships. Except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So in other words, God made us to have proper husband-wife sexual relationships. The only way that you should defraud one another is that if you both together consent for a period of time to fast or pray. And then notice what it says. Come together again that Satan tempt you not because you haven't been consistent in your relationships with one another. And we're still physical. And even though we're not born, and we won't sin when we're born, we're begotten, but the flesh is still there. So we have to overcome the flesh, and this is one way that we can try to do it. But a fifth way in which our prayers can be hindered if we're not careful is if we ignore the cry of the poor. Now, I realize that we cannot feed everybody in the world. We just can't do it. We can't clothe everybody in the world. But at least we can start out with our own congregation, our own people. If anybody ever has needs, just let us let each other know, and then we can try to help each other. But notice what God says in Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. Psalms, then Proverbs, the Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 21, then verse 13. Whoso 
Bible stops his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. That's pretty clear. That's explicit. God says if any one of us, as a New Testament Christian, fail to help our brothers and sisters who are poor, and remember the whole Old Testament is written for Israel, which was a church in the wilderness. That was the church of that day. Today, it's spiritual Israel. And so if we turn our ears away from someone who is poor and who literally needs help, I don't mean somebody who won't work, because the Bible says if a man won't work, don't let him eat. He's worse than an infidel. But if a person is trying and some tragedy or something happens, then we need to turn our ears to their cry and help them. Because if we don't help, then we will not be heard ourselves when we cry out to God. I think it says it very clearly, and I don't see how we can get around it. In Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25, and starting in verse 31 to 46. Now, I won't read all of that. I'm just going to mainly summarize it. But Matthew 25, this is the area of Scripture where Jesus shows very clearly what a true New Testament Christian is. A true New Testament Christian. I'd given a sermon a couple of years ago on what will be your judgment or what judgment will come upon you that will determine your entrance into the kingdom. And I use this as the base text for that sermon. And starting in verse 31, the time setting is when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and He's going to sit on the throne of His glory. Then, verse 32, before Him shall get, be gathered the nations. All right, then you go on down. Verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom. Then you go on down, and they wanted to know why. They asked a question, how are we going to inherit this kingdom? Jesus said, for when I was hungry, you gave me meat. When I was thirsty, verse 35, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. Verse 36, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you came to visit me. When I was in prison, you came unto me. So they visited people in prison. But these righteous people wanted to know, well, Father, or Jesus Christ, we never once. We, we lived in the 19th, 20th century. We never did see you. You died. You ascended to the Father. and You were at the, His right hand for all these centuries. When did we do this to you? And Jesus went on down and made it very clear, starting down verse 41, or 42. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And then they wanted to know, when did we do this to you? He said in the middle of verse 45, Insomuch as you did it to one of these least, you did it unto me. So when we help one another as New Testament Christians to stave off poverty, hungry, cold, and we help to clothe one another, then we're doing it personally to Jesus Christ. Because it's Christ living His life over inside of that person through the power of His Holy Spirit. So you're literally doing it to Jesus Christ by the very presence of His Spirit inside that person's mind. So I think this is something we need to do. Not ignore the cry of the poor, the hungry, the destitute, when it's within our power to do something about it. And I, I want to give you a reason. Galatians 6. Galatians 6, verse 7. And this will make it very explicit why God has given us instructions and if we ignore them, there is going to be ramifications. Galatians 6, verse 7. There is a law that God has set in motion. It's cause and effect. God will say, you do this and this will be the result. You do that and this will be the result. It's cause and effect. Galatians 6, verse 7. Notice if we ignore the poor. What if we ignore contributions to the ministry? No matter what it is. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. So if we sow giving, then we're doing it to Jesus Christ and He's going to give to us. But if we're stingy and we, we refrain from giving and helping, whether it's the poor or whether it's our church work we're doing, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. And if we're stingy with doing it, then He's going to withhold those blessings from us. And also, as we saw in the verse, first scripture, Proverbs 21, 13, that He would not hear us that's one of the connections to prayer, not to ignore the poor. So a sixth hindrance, why our prayers might be just going to the ceiling and that's all, rather than going into the very throne room of God, is that we will ask or maybe we want something that's for the wrong purpose. It's to consume it upon our own lust rather than to find out what the will of God is 
and then pray with that with that in mind. In uh, Hebrews or James, it is James chapter four. James chapter four, verse one through five. James four verses one through five. From where comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even your own lust that war in your members? In the sermon I gave how we should mortify the flesh, we do have passions and lusts that are in our fleshly body. And this is where wars and brawlings and so on come from. Verse 2, you lust and have not. Now notice the next word, you kill. Now if you have a more expensive Bible, you can see that that's a mistranslation. It'll correct it for you in the margin. It should say you envy. You envy. You're jealous of someone else, of what they have. And you desire to have and you cannot obtain it. You fight in war, yet you have not. Why? Because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. You ask for the wrong purpose, the wrong intent, the wrong motive of mind is behind it. That you may consume it upon your own lust. So many times that's why prayers go up to God and they don't come back answered because we only want it out of selfish motivations. We shouldn't do that. Verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So when we go to God praying for things that are not according to His will, but to consume it upon our own lust, we have become at enmity with God. That's why He won't answer our prayers. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy? No, we didn't say it in vain. It's true, and every one of us know it, because we've given in to the weakness of the flesh in the past so many times. And yet, if we'll get our minds on the Spirit, we'll seek out and search what God's will is, we won't have a problem. Now, in 1 John 5, I want to show you the opposite of lusting. 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence that we have in Him. This is Jesus Christ. That if we ask anything according to His will, He'll hear us. That's dynamite. If we can discern what God's will is, and the only way to do it is through studying the Scriptures. That's the only way we can do it. Verse 15, And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Because we know His will, we're not asking to consume it upon our own lust out of envy but because we know this is what God wants for our life. And so we can ask, and we can have confidence and absolutely know that He's going to provide it. But there's a seventh reason that our prayers are hindered, and why they're not heard, heard of God, and that is indifference. Remember in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, uh, these are letters to the seven churches. The last church was a church of the Laodiceans. And he said, because you're not either on fire for me or you're not cold, but you're sort of in between, you're sort of lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. This is what I mean. An indifferent person. Oh, yeah, I love God. Oh, I go to church every time the doors are open. They're just there in body presence. They make a mental acknowledgement of God. But they're not on fire for God. In Matthew 6, Matthew 6, verse 7. This is on the... Jesus Christ doing the speaking when He told them how to pray. He said in Matthew 6, verse 7, But when you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. So we don't just go in and say a same prayer that we've memorized. We use our minds in order to generate thoughts, real thoughts that we need to go to God for and not just the same old thing over and over and over. But think first. Sit down if necessary and write out a list of things. I know this is what I need. I know this is what so-and-so needs. This person needs prayer for healing. The work needs things that we need to pray about. We need more income so that we can have a better magazine or something of this nature. Anything to do with the brethren, to do with God, Jesus Christ, His purpose on earth, then sit down. Write it down. And then go down. Check it off as you're going down the list. And then wholeheartedly ask God for each one of those and pray for them specifically. Get real specific. I mean, if somebody is sick and you know where the problem is, ask God to heal that specific problem. Like this tumor that I told you about in the announcements. Go specifically for that tumor so that God will remove it. But the whole point I'm making here is 
when you have a set, a rote prayer where you just repeat it, there is no, there's nothing but indifference. You don't even know what you're saying. You just memorize it, you set it with no thought behind it. So James 5, James 5, verse 13 to 18. James 5, verse 13 to 18. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That's what we're talking about. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. This means older members of the church who have been in the faith through study and years of study. Their faith has been built up. They have confidence to go to God for healing. And let them pray over him. This is the sick. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. This is dynamite. Verse 16. Now this is the key that's coming into this. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another. That you may be healed. Now look at the next phrase. And then after reading this next phrase, can we ever go to God in an indifferent prayer and expect an answer? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But if we're not effectual, and if we're not fervent before God, it's indifferent. Verse, well, that's all I wanted to read there. But it just goes on to show how Elijah went to God and he asked him to withhold the rain, and he did for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, fervently, that it would rain, and it did. So this shows the results of prayer. God does answer prayer. Hosea. Hosea. That's one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Chapter 7. Daniel. After Daniel. Hosea. Chapter 7. Verse 11 to 14. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. We'll get the context here. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. So you see, they're not turning to God. They're going after a, an alliance with other nations. When they shall go, I'll spread my net upon them. This is God, first person, saying, Look, they're not crying out to me, but they're going to Assyria. They're going down to Egypt. They're looking for political alliances for salvation instead of their God. I'll bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. I'll chastise them as their congregation has heard. And I believe this is for today. I believe this is a prophecy for today, and they're going to be hearing that God is going to destroy the United States, Britain, and the British Commonwealth, because they have not listened to their God. They've turned away from God. Look at verse 13. Woe unto them, for they fled from me, destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I've redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Now look what he says. And they have not cried unto me with their heart. They didn't put all their heart into their cries to God, their prayers to God for deliverance. Rather, they went to Egypt, the Assyrians, the nations around them for political alliances in order not to go to war and to go into captivity and be defeated. They didn't turn to God, but they became rebels against God. Well, an eighth hindrance to our prayers, if we're not very careful... And I realize this one is very touchy because every one of us are different. Each one of us come from a different background. We had different religious concepts before we started studying this book, which, we had, which had been handed down to us from our parents, our parents, grandparents, and on back. And so this one is very touchy because not one of us can look into the mind of the other person. We can't do it. We can't read one another's mind, so we don't know how much faith a person has or a lack of faith. And a lack of faith is one of those things that does hinder prayer. And yet none of us can look at someone else and say, you have a lack of faith. That can only be between you and God and your constant searching of these scriptures. But I want to show you some scriptures that a lack of faith could be a reason why our prayers are not hindered from time to time. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And the reason I'm giving these is so I can help each one of us to have our faith built up so that every prayer we ever utter, we will expect an answer and God will so honor it that we'll get that answer because we need to have prayers answered. But a lack of faith, Matthew 9, verse 29 and 30. You can go back and read the context for yourself. Jesus was going to heal two blind men. They didn't know it yet, but they came asking him. Then touched Jesus their eyes, saying, According to your faith, 
be it unto you. Jesus said that their faith definitely played an important factor in whether they were healed or not. And I can't deny that because it says it. And their eyes were open. So they did have faith. Now, Jesus was there. They had heard how he had raised the dead, how he had healed the blind, how he had cleansed lepers. So Jesus was there in, his, in their day. So it was easy for them to go and hunt them out. It was easy for them to have faith because they knew he just did all this in the next city or maybe the next block. But here we live nearly 2,000 years down the line, and this is all on paper. So we have to read it, and we have to believe it, and we have to prove that God exists, and if He exists and He will not lie, then we need to develop the confidence that God will never lie, and when we see He says He'll heal, He will heal, or answer any prayer that we have. But in Hebrews 11, verse 6, once again, this makes very clear that faith is an absolute with God. We have to have it. We have to develop it so that we'll never have a lack of faith or a lack of confidence in God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. That's as simple and as straightforward as we can get. For he that comes to God must believe that He is, and that He, this is God, is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. This is dynamite. So if we prove God exists by fulfilled prophecy in the Bible, if we look into all of these various scriptures and see the deception in the world today and how all the churches that claim to live from this book and see they're not, and then when we turn to what this book says, we're going to be developing faith. The more we read, the more we study, the faith is going to come. James 1, James 1, the next book after Hebrews, verse 5 through 8 will tell us a little more about the lack of faith. And this can hinder us from getting our prayers to God. James 1, verse 5 to 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Notice, not wavering. None at all. Never doubt once that God won't answer that prayer. For he that wavers is like a wave of a ship driven with a wind and tossed. So you're out of control. You're not sure if God's going to answer you or not. So you're tossed to and fro. Well, Willie, you're sitting on edge waiting to figure out whether God is going to heal you or not. Just walk away once you've prayed knowing absolutely that you're doing everything in your life that you know of proper before God. And then you ask for whatever you want. And if you know that it's within the will of God, he's going to get it. Verse 7, For let not that man, this is the man that wavers, and he's driven like a ship out of control. Let not this man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 8, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Or you can put in her ways too. His or her, when we come in prayer, if we have doubts that God is going to hear and answer, it's going to hinder that prayer. It may be years before you may have a certain prayer answered because you have doubted. Doubted, doubted, until you have developed more faith by more of the study of the Word of God. And then suddenly that same prayer you prayed five years ago is suddenly answered because now you've got the faith. See, a lack of faith does definitely hinder prayer. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 28 to 30. Now, this is a scripture where Paul had been correcting the Corinthians on how to take what we call the Lord's Supper, communion, or the Passover each year. And Paul is setting them straight on the proper conduct at the Passover service. Down in verse 28 and 30, notice what he says. But let a man examine himself. That means you look at your thought processes. You decide and correct them with the scriptures to decide whether you are obeying God or not. And let him so eat of that bread and drink of that cup. This is what we do at Passover when we memorialize the body, broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 29, For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks, it says damnation, but it should be judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or die. Because we didn't have the faith that the broken body of Jesus Christ was for the healing of our physical sicknesses. And so we get sick, we don't have the confidence, and many times we die. But it's up to God. Now, how can we develop 
this lack of faith into a dynamic, strong faith. Okay, the Bible gives us an answer to that. Romans 10, verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. This is so simple, and yet it's so overlooked. So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. This Bible is the Word of God. The more you study it, the more you hear sermons, and the more you go to Bible studies, and the more you participate in a discussion of this book, the more you learn and your faith is built to where you become a dynamic, faithful person. But there is a ninth reason why our prayers are sometimes hindered. And that is because we have such a thankless attitude. Instead of being thankful and joyful for everything we have, sometimes we can have a thankless attitude toward God. In 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, that's right before Timothy, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 to 18. It says, Rejoice evermore. That's verse 16. Boy, that's dynamite. Rejoice evermore. No matter what your circumstances, which is very difficult from time to time when pressure is on you from every side. Then verse 17, pray without ceasing. So rejoicing and praying are right in the context there. Now look at verse 18. In everything gives thanks. In everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Can you say that this is the will of God to give thanks? I don't care what circumstance you're in in life. I don't care what the problem is and the pressure. If they're fixing to let the guillotine go down and kill you, you should be praising God that you're worthy to die for His name. And if we'll do this, we're going to remove some hindrances for having our prayers answered. Because if we're praising God, who knows? He might just let the guillotine go up instead of down. <laughs> His angel can do it. So, have a thankful attitude, not thankless. Well, another scripture is Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Speaking to yourselves, this is all Christians, in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Look at verse 20 now. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything, irregardless. And buddy, that's tough. It's tough. Because some of the road that some of us have already gone down and are moving into, it's going to be very difficult. Especially with the international socialist communist movement when they're going to outlaw Christianity. And you talk about being thankful. What about those people in Nebraska, Louisville, Nebraska, that have already had to flee? And they're now, the wives are in Liberty, Missouri, and they can't go back to Nebraska. The husbands, seven husbands, are in jail in isolation wards and no visitors. And yet there's not a crime or there's not a charge against them. All because they wouldn't bring their children and turn them over to the courts and let them put them in foster homes. And so they were called in for contempt of court, slapped in jail, and they've been there, and now they won't even let them have visitors. Only hardened murderers and criminals that are dangerous to society are put in this type of isolation ward, and yet now they are there. These are people who profess Jesus Christ and are on fire for God rather than letting the state supersede their faith. Well... They are thankful for Jesus Christ, and I think we should be too. Colossians 4, verse 2, to show this thankful attitude that we should always have, and it even connects it with prayer in this particular verse. Colossians 4, verse 2, continue in prayer. Continue, don't give up now. Continue in prayer and watch in the same. The same what? Prayer. Watch in the prayer with thanksgiving. So if we're praying with a thankful attitude, no matter what our circumstances are, our prayers are going to get through to God. He's going to hear us. And we're going to remove the hindrance. And boy, if we don't have some dynamic prayers, after removing all these hindrances that have been standing in our way, and we don't start seeing some healings that are going to be out of sight, we're going to have to give the sermon again, <laughs> and then again, <laughs> until we get it right. Okay, but there's a tenth reason that our prayers are hindered. And that is because we as individual Christians refuse to be corrected of God. We refuse correction. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 23 through 33. Proverbs 1. Verse 23. I'll start while some of you are turning. Turn you at my reproof. This is God. 
He's saying, look, turn at my reproof. Behold, I'll pour out my Spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. If we'll only turn and be corrected in everything that this book says, whether it's doctrine or whether it's our personal sins and our personal lives, if we'll change God, it's a promise. He said, I will make known my words to you. That means His will. Then, that's another hindrance out of the way. We'll know what the will of God is. Our prayers are going to get through. That's dynamite. Verse 24, Because I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Here God's calling and nobody would listen. But you've said it not, all my counsel. You just turned your back on everything I said and would none of my reproof. Look what God says if we have this attitude toward Him. I also will laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your fear comes. If we turn our back upon God and we don't reprove ourselves based upon this book when He reveals it to us in our personal lives, He's going to laugh at our calamity because we deserve what we're going to get. Verse 27, When your fear comes as desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish comes upon you, then He's going to be laughing. Verse 27, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. If we don't correct ourselves, God is not obligated to answer. He's making the call and He's calling us. He's revealing truth to us through this book. But if we refuse that correction, He's not obligated to answer us. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, because they refused. For that, that they hated knowledge. They didn't want to know what God had for them. I did, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Is there a scripture that absolutely says what the fear of the Lord is? Yes, it is. Look in the previous verses, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is, equals, the beginning of knowledge. Until you reverence God, until you literally fear to disobey anything He reveals to you, you're never going to accept the knowledge. And if you won't do that, you won't be corrected and God won't hear you. It's that simple. But that's a tough one to carry. That's a tough load to carry. And only Jesus Christ will take that burden off your shoulders and He can convert you and He can make the way easy. Verse 31, or verse 30. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way. God's going to lead you to yourself if you won't be corrected and, he, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them. Just turn away from God and go your own way and you're going to end up slain. I don't mean just dead, but I mean in all kinds of circumstances. And it says the prosperity. But the Revised Standard Version says complacency or lukewarmness. And the lukewarmness of fools shall destroy them. That's why we can't be fools. But whoso listens unto me, verse 33, shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So I think it's only right that we should be willing to be corrected of God so that we'll have no difficulty whatsoever with communicating with God so that He can solve our problems for us. Because there's too many problems in this world. There's Satan, there's all the demons. There's now governments that are becoming tyrannical. All these problems are coming upon us and we're going to need to be corrected so that we can come under the hand of God and He will have the protective hand that He can bring us through it. Turn to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, 12. Isaiah 65, verse 12. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and you shall all bow down to the slaughter. Why is this going to happen to these people? Because when I called, I held out my hand, I called you, you did not answer. When I spake, you didn't hear, but did evil before my eyes. They wouldn't turn, they wouldn't take reproof from God, turn around and go the other way. It's called repentance. They did evil before my eyes and did choose that wherein I delighted not. They'd rather sin than obey God, so they went the wrong way. Chapter 66, right across the page in my Bible, verse 4. I also will choose their delusions. Remember 2 Thessalonians 2, where it's talking about a great falling away, and because they didn't have a love of the truth, the truth, that God would send them great delusions, or illusions, so that they would believe a lie. And it says here, I'll choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. 
They wouldn't listen to God. They wouldn't be corrected. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that which I delighted not. Constant rebellion against God and not being corrected. That is a hindrance to our prayers. But let's go just a couple more here. Zechariah, which is next to the last book in the Old Testament, chapter 7, verse 8 to 13. Chapter 7, 8 to 13. And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment. Now this is what God wants of us. Show mercy, compassion, every man to his brother. Oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let not... And let none of your you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to listen. God was trying to correct them, and they wouldn't listen. But notice what they did. Sometimes, you know, you can have an argument with somebody, a friend or something, and then you'll come up, and they turn their back and start to walk away, and you come up and put your shoulder, your hand on their shoulder and say, I'm sorry. And then they'll just pull their shoulder away, showing that they don't want anything to do with you. Look what it says here in verse 11. They refused to hearken or listen and pulled away the shoulder, just jerked it away and wouldn't obey. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. They made it solid rock. They were fixed in their way and they would not be reproved and corrected of God. So he says he will not listen to them. Their prayers won't get above the roof. Now, why have I quoted from so many Old Testament examples? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 will explain. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because God gave everything in the Old Testament for us to learn from. So that we'll not be like they were. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 and 12. In the previous 10 verses in 1 Corinthians 10, it's talking about Israel. How God brought them out of the land of Egypt and the various things they did. And how they sinned, committed fornication and so on. They tempted Christ. Then in verse 11 it says, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. New Testament Christians upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now the word ends in the Greek language denotes purposes. So upon whom the purposes of the world are come. Wherefore, all right, because all those things were written for us, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Make sure that we're willing to have a pliable, corrective attitude before God. But there's yet an eleventh reason why people's prayers are hindered. And that is because we have an unforgiving attitude toward other people. It can be anybody, not just each other, but it can be anybody. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Verse 24 to 26. Therefore I say unto you, this is Jesus talking, What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you'll receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. Notice, our prayers are hinged together with forgiveness. If you have ought against any, forgive that person if you have anything against somebody else, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Then verse 26, But if any of you... Do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. That's clear. Our forgiveness hinges on our capability or our willingness to forgive somebody else. Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their, trespass, their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Notice the if. You, you perform, then God will perform. Verse 15, But if you forgive not, if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So if you're holding a grudge against anybody, and you don't forgive that person and forget it and have a clean mind, then you're not going to have forgiveness. It's that simple. God says, If you do this, then I will perform. If you don't do it, God won't do it. So we wonder why there's so much bitterness in the Christian community, why there's so many factions and infightings because of lack of forgiveness. And so God won't forgive, and we're going around with this burden on our shoulders. Now also, you can refer to James 2.13. I'm not going to turn there today, but James 2.13 and Matthew 18.21 and 22. Both of those scriptures fit in well also. 
11th. But the 12th point that might bring a hindrance to answered prayer is our own self-righteousness. We impute righteousness to ourselves instead of God's righteousness in us. Or you might say vanity. Vanity. Job chapter 35. Job's way back there. Job 35, verse 12 and 13. There, there they cry, but none gives answer because of the pride of evil men. Here they cry to God. God won't answer because of their pride. Surely God will not hear vanity. He won't do it. So unless we humble ourselves and look at other people and esteem them better than ourselves, then God is not going to hear us because vanity will stand in our way. Luke 18. This is in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 18, verse 9 to 14. <clears throat> Jesus was given an example here of, when, of two men when they went into the uh, synagogue to pray. And he spake this parable unto the certain which trusted in themselves. Now that's self-righteousness. Here were some of the scribes and Pharisees, and they were self-confident. See, they were self-righteous. They trusted in their own ways instead of God's ways. That they were righteous. So see, these guys were, they thought that they were righteous, and they despised other people. They looked down upon them. Two men went into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a publican. Now, a publican was a tax collector. Everybody hated publicans because they were representatives of Rome, the official government coming and taking tribute away from them. They were in slavery and they had to pay their taxes to this Roman Empire. The Pharisees stood and prayed like this unto God. Oh, I thank God that I'm not as other men. Oh, I'm not as those executioners. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. Oh, look how good I am. I'm not even like that publican over there. I fast twice a week. Oh, how good I am. Oh, look at me, God. I give tithes of all that I possess. I'm good. Look, if you don't believe me, ask me. I'll tell you how much I give. And the publican, standing way off, he would not even as much as lift up his eyes into heaven. But he knew who he was. And he smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, this publican, it wouldn't even lift his eyes to God because he knew he was a sinner and God could read his mind and his heart. He didn't, he didn't have to put on airs. He went down to his house justified rather than the Pharisee. For everyone that exalts himself becomes self-righteous, becomes vain, will be abased. And he that humbles himself will be exalted. That's dynamite. If we can just remember that, and that's going to eliminate these hindrances that keep our prayers from being answered. Well, a thirteenth point is unrepentant attitude. We fail to repent of the sins we have already committed. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. So here, it's written very clearly the reason that their prayers weren't heard was because they didn't turn from their iniquities. They didn't repent. So they did go into this Babylonian captivity. Well, now Zechariah 7, verse 12. Zechariah 7, verse 12. A lack of repentance cuts us off from God because we remain in our sins and He won't listen to us. Zechariah 7, verse 12. Oops, I'm in the wrong chapter here. I'm about to read the reverse, 12.7 instead of 7.12. <clears throat> yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in His Spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. They just would not listen to the law of God and therefore let God's law correct them and change them. And so as a direct result, they were cut off from God and their prayers weren't heard. But the 14th point that might hinder us, and the final point today, is that we just finally quit trying. Instead of seeking out the reason why our prayer is not heard and correcting it, we just give up and quit trying. Well, 
It so happens that usually you can find something in the Bible for about anything you want to know. In Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8, Luke 18, verse 1 to 8, Jesus spoke a parable unto them, these are the people who were there with him, that men ought always to pray and notice and not to faint or not grow weary and get tired and quit trying. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God. So this was an atheist, you might say. Neither regarded men. He didn't look at anybody. Rich, poor, it didn't matter who you were. And he didn't pay any attention to God either. So he wasn't interested in justice. Verse 3. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, I don't fear God. I don't regard any man. Yet because this widow troubles me, she kept going back and going back saying, Look, avenge me, avenge me. I'll avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. So if we'll just keep going to God and saying, Show me what's wrong. Why will you not answer me? I want to know. Reveal it to me so that I can get rid of it. If we have that repentant attitude and we keep going back and going back and we won't quit, God's going to answer. Verse 6, And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect? And who are his elect but those who have God's Holy Spirit and who are trying to please him in everything that we're trying to do? We are. I believe that. I'm confident. I know everybody in this room. And I'm confident that we're sincere before God. And he said that he will avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he hear long with them or bear along with them. So sometime God waits to see if we will persist or whether we quit trying. I tell you that He will avenge them speedily. Now, I want to give a final solution to all this. Fourteen points. I'm just going to list them briefly, give the final scripture, which is a solution. There are fourteen ways in which our prayers can be hindered and we won't be heard. Number one, was gone, we went astray. We've gone astray. Number two, hypocrisy. Number three, idolatry. Number four, family problems. Number five, we ignore the cry of the poor. Number six, we ask or want something for the wrong purpose, for our own lust. Number seven, indifference, complacency. Number eight, lack of faith. Number nine, we have a thankless attitude instead of thankful attitude. Number ten, we refuse correction. Number 11, we have an unforgiving attitude. Number 12, we become self-righteous or we become vain. Number 13, we have an unrepentant attitude. Number 14, we just simply quit trying and quit praying. Well, in 1 John, it gives the answer. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 to 24. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him. And here it is now. This is why we'll receive it. But remember, we've got to meet the qualification first, and then God will answer. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. And what was that commandment? The first six, love toward God. The last six, love toward our neighbor as ourself. Then verse 24. He that keeps His commandments dwells in Him and He in Him. So we're in Christ and Christ in us. And hereby we know that He abides in us by the Spirit which He's given us. So if we will obey God and take these points to heart and correct them in our life, we're going to get some answered prayers. I'm confident.